Hello, welcome. I'm Jeffrey Martin, director of the University of Georgia Performing Arts Center. Thank you so much for joining us today for Arts Chats, part of our virtual programming series this season. This recording is uh, going to be archived on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, so you can return to watch it again or share it with your friends. I hope you will join us as we continue to offer performances and events in our virtual concert series in the weeks ahead. Please visit us online at pac.uga.edu to learn more about these events. Now on with today's show. I'm very pleased to welcome my good friend, Frank Wildhorn, to the studio today. Frank is a multi-Grammy, Tony, and Emmy Award-nominated composer and producer whose works span the, world, the worlds of popular, theatrical, and classical music. In 1999, he became the first American composer in 22 years to have three shows running simultaneously on Broadway, Jekyll and Hyde, The Scarlet Pimpernel, and The Civil War. Frank's additional Broadway productions include Dracula, Victor Victoria, Wonderland, Bonnie and Clyde, and the 2013 revival of Jekyll and Hyde. Frank has long enjoyed a robust international career as well. His productions outside the United States include Excalibur, Cyrano de Bergerac, The Count of Monte Cristo, Carmen, Rudolph, Mitsuko, Never Say Goodbye, Camille Claudel, Tears of Heaven, Death Note, Matahari, and The Man Who Laughs. As a side note, I had the great pleasure of producing the American premiere of The Count of Monte Cristo in 2015. Frank's upcoming projects include Song of Bernadette, Peter the Great, Your Lion April, Huberman, and Casanova, and I'm sure many others. He served as music director for the Goodwill Games in New York City in 1998 and wrote the song Gold, the opening number for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Some of the many artists who have covered uh, and performed Frank's work include Whitney Houston, whose number one hit, Where Do Broken Hearts Go?, you probably know, as well as Natalie Cole, Kenny Rogers, Sammy Davis Jr., Liza Minnelli, Julie Andrews, Linda Etter, Trisha Yearwood, Trace Adkins, Patti LaBelle, B.B. Winans, Amy Grant, Anthony Warlow, and many, many more. As you can imagine, he probably doesn't get a whole lot of sleep. We're so glad he's here with us today. Let's welcome Frank Wildhorn. Hello, Frank. Hello, Jeffrey. Aloha. And I do get a lot of sleep. Don't oh, worry. you do. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I don't know when you do all your work, but I'm glad you're getting enough sleep. How are things with you? We're great. We're very fortunate in this crazy, insane time we live in. Uh, I'm here in Honolulu, Hawaii. So aloha. Uh, we're kind of above the Pacific Ocean here in Waikiki, uh, and very grateful for every day to be here. Hmm. And you've just made a move from New York to Hawaii, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, we came here actually to, to stay for a little bit, you know, as the virus was getting really bad this summer in, in New York, and we, we came in August, and we were going to go back to New York in September, and our flights all got canceled, we couldn't go back, so we decided to stay another month. Our flights got canceled again, so I thought the gods were telling me, <laughs> telling me something I should listen to. And we, we, Takako, my wife and I both love Hawaii very, very much. We have a wonderful history here. And the truth is, after a couple of months, it was like, why am I going back to New York? It's going to be a long time when new shows are being produced in New York right now, which of course affects theater everywhere else around the country. We don't, there is many more questions that there is answers there. On the other side of it, you know, it's a very fruitful and creative time for me because of all the commissions that I have, both in the theater, pop, and classical. And, you know, I'm a lot healthier here, and we swim every day, and we eat better, and uh, it's, a, it's just, it's a blessing to be here, and I'm very grateful for that. And so here we'll stay for a while. You know, we have, you know, a property and, and, a, and a place in Tokyo as well, but Hawaii is, is the place to be right now. Well, you're kind of well situated in between then your kind of your two bases in New York and Asia. So that that ought to be a nice place to be. It, it is. And also, you know, from a career standpoint, Asia is way ahead of America as far as theater opening again. In Japan, theater has opened again. Uh, sometimes it's 50 to 75 percent, sometimes more. Korea, it is opening right now. In fact, my 10th anniversary of Monte Cristo 
which you so beautifully produced for me here in America, uh, opens next week in, in Seoul. And uh, hopefully if things go smooth, that will have a, you know, a run now. I'm not sure what the government says as far as percentage you can have in a theater yet, but that's coming alive. And I think with end of spring, summer, fall, next year, et cetera, it's going to be healthy. I don't know what's going to happen here. This is a different situation. So yeah, being situated here in Hawaii makes it a little easier and it makes it nicer for my producers in Asia to bring me back and forth, of course. Now, I'm sure Hawaii, I mean, who could think of a more ideal setting for inspiring the creative juices? So have, have you found that it's been uh, helping your creative creativity while you've yes. been? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, you know, there's a history in Hawaii of great novelists like James Michener living <laughs> here and, and, and writing. And I totally get that, you know. In fact, I, I think I've, I think I've, I haven't come to terms with it yet, but I've kind of made a change in my own career life, which is usually, as you know, Jeffrey, I am so hands-on on all my projects, right? Mm -hmm. But I think living here in Hawaii and being as productive as I see I can be here, I think I'm going to stay here more and then let my guys and teams around the world do the legwork. You know the demos and the and the stuff, and I'll I'll come for openings and important things and stuff, but it's hard to get me away from here right now, and, <laughs> and I can see a change in the lifestyle that I think is going to add years to my life, and I, I love it. And as far as being creative, yeah, I mean, you wake up in the morning and you know you're looking at the ocean and the mountains and stuff like that, and if if you can't get juice from that, then I don't know what you know. Yeah. So it's good. Wow, that's great. What can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on during this time? Give us some sneak peeks. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a tough time out there because there hasn't been any shows. You know, myself, I've had over 140 titles canceled since this started. But thank God there was a lot of good commissions that I had before this started and money more now. And I'm doing Casanova for Vienna, which I'm very excited about. I'm hmm. doing Peter the Great for the city of St. Petersburg, which will be both a show and a celebration of Peter and Great, Peter the Great for the city. It's a giant project. Hmm. Uh, we're the first Americans to be commissioned to do a, a show for uh, China uh, from a beautiful company called Joyway. And I'm doing Bruce Lee and Ip Man for China right now. Uh, Bruce Lee, of course, is the most famous Asian probably around the world. But in China, his mentor. Uh, Ip Man is actually more famous, so he combined the two. Um, in Japan right now, I have back-to-back -back two big new manga shows. You know, Death Note was such a big success all over Asia and will be coming west soon when, when we're allowed. Uh, but the success of that has led to some new ones. So Fist of the North Star is going to be next year, and in the beginning of 22 will be Your Lie in April, another manga show. About mm -hmm. classical music, by the way. In Seoul right now, we, we've just been commissioned to do Michelangelo and Da Vinci. Uh, their rivalry and relationship and uh, Florence and the Renaissance and, and all of that kind of stuff. So there's plenty of new work out there. And probably the most special thing that I'm doing right now is um, I've been commissioned to write my first, first full-length classical symphony mm -hmm. for Vienna, which will be premiered in Vienna, God willing, later this summer if the health of everything is okay. And that's a very special project, as you can imagine. Wow, that's incredible. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's called The Voice of the Danube, which is the Danube River that flows through most of Eastern Europe. And it's the history of the Danube and the cultures that the Danube goes through, which is everything from you know Germany and, and, and Austria, Budapest, Romania, out into the Black Sea. Um, and uh, they asked me to musicalize that journey, and so I have. Uh, Kim Schoenberg, who is my orchestrator for Jekyll and Hyde and Scarlet Pimpernel and many, many others, is actually orchestrating this full-length symphony. Wow. Um, as you know, a lot of new classical music is kind of atonal, and, and you know that's not where I am. I'm about melody. Mm -hmm. And so this is a symphony that's kind of ultra-romantic and ultra-melodic and more in touch with the Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky, my favorite classical composers. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited about it. And it's also very scary. <laughs> it's, a, you know, for a self-taught jazz piano player to be writing a symphony for a Vienna orchestra is kind of crazy. Wow. But uh, people seem to be very excited about it. And uh, we'll see what happens when it happens. 
That's incredible. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I, listen, well, uh, it's gonna once it's premiered in Vienna, then obviously it's it's gonna be everywhere. So you have an orchestra down there. Uh, exactly. They'll play it for you. Yeah, I hope so. I'll have to we get them. We do that. That would be a fun project. Yeah, it would. Wow. Um, I'm fascinated with the uh, the industry of like the Broadway industry in Asia. I think a lot of people in America probably don't really know how big musical theater is, particularly in Korea and South Korea and uh, Japan. Can you tell us a little bit about the industry there and how it works? Sure, it's, it's a good question. Uh, you know, it starts with the fact that I come from pop music. You know, I, I was a, a writer working for publishing companies and if artists, big artists didn't do my work, then my kids weren't gonna eat. And uh, I, I, it's important to know that's where I come from. And the reason why is because that's an international business. The music publishing business is an international business. So you are encouraged and inspired to write for the world. They tell you you're writing for the world. You know, and artists will sing your songs in different languages and stuff. And, and that's a good thing for your life and for your kids, et cetera, et cetera. And so even when I came to theater, you know, I was always a little bit of an outsider in that I was always still writing for the world, not for five blocks in New York City. Five blocks in New York City is great and very important. And of course, it's the, if you want to play baseball, you want to play in Yankee Stadium. That's Broadway. Broadway's Yankee Stadium. But, you know, times are changing and the world has changed. It's gotten more sophisticated and producers around the world now have the financial ability to produce their own shows. And as opposed to constantly importing from New York or London, now they want to create things and they want to export them. Mm -hmm. And they have the talent and the, and the facilities to do that. And I got caught up in the middle of that kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s. So we, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, have more international adventures and shows than anybody out there. Um, and what happens is, you know, if you have success, success breeds success. So, you know, Jekyll, there's over 3,000 productions of Jekyll around the world. And those successes of Jekyll, especially in Korea, Jekyll is the longest running American show, 17 years now, ever. Um, you know, Japan, it's 9, 10. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it is what it is. It's great everywhere. And, and that led to relationships with producers that led to commissions. And so that's a big part of my life right now. And I still have the same attitude I did when I was a pop writer, which is I'm writing for the world, obviously, including New York. And you want as many shows to get to New York as you can. But what people don't realize is that the Asian community, the Asian audience, which means these days, it's not, it used to be very separate, not anymore. Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Indonesia, and now the new kid on the block, which is China, together is the biggest market in the world by 10 mm. times. It's such a huge market. And they're figuring it out. They're figuring out how to be a market how to, as opposed to being separate countries, just to be an Asian market. And I guess I'm on the forefront of that because, uh, you know, my next show in Japan will be my 21st show in Japan. Mm. And I think we've had 15 or 16 in Korea, and now we're starting uh, in China. And it's very exciting. It's a little like the Wild West, you know, that we're trying to figure out what's going to be and stuff like that. But, you know, again, it all starts with being able to financially support it, and they can do that. And because of that, the opportunities are there, and uh, it's a huge market, and uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Oh, that's great. Now, um, I assume you write these with your writing partners. You write them in English, and then do the local producers then hire translators to, to translate them? Well, th that's how it started 10, 10, 15 years ago. Not anymore. Uh, now it's about... I, I still do probably 60 to 70 percent with English writing teams, but now it's getting more and more where they're hiring me to do the be the composer and working with their own local director, librettist, lyricists, and then sometimes translate them back to English because they have to have hits in their own market first. And even though they have great translators like they do in Europe, everywhere around the world, and I'm lucky to have the best of those people, the fact is, if it's written in their native language first, it flows better. Uh, mm. The people are more comfortable with it on their ear. And I, I understand that. You know, this, this is a new thing. This really has only been the last five years. 
Mm. But a lot of my new shows, I'm actually working with Japanese or Korean or Chinese collaborators. And then we'll go from there. So it's a, it's a change that's happening right now. It's right mm. in the beginning of that change. And like I said, there's still shows that I demand that I want to do with an English first. But if it's a subject matter that's kind of, you know, more intrinsic to the place, then I'm okay writing with it. And, and again, you know, it's, it's an international adventure. And music like love knows no boundaries. Uh, and so if the music is what it is and it's still performed with the passion that I write it with, usually good things happen and the audience gets it. Hmm. Wow. It's so interesting. It's an amazing adventure, Jeff. And, and you, you know, uh, Freddie Gershon, who's kind of like the, my rabbi in, in the world, he runs MTI Music, Music Theater International, which licenses mine, but everybody shows. He's the one that pushed me to be international in the late 90s. He said, Frank, it's going to change your life in so many ways. And the fact is, is my wife, Takako, is Japanese. She's a Japanese star. Uh, in Japan, they, she goes by Yoko Wow. I met her because of all of this. Hmm. So there you go. There's the proof. And she starred in one of your shows with Dracula. Yeah, actually, my, uh, she was the top star of a, a famous company called Takarazaka, all-girl company. And I was the first American to write an original show for them. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was writing for her. Hmm. So we met first day of rehearsal in Japan after I was blessed by a Shinto and Buddhist priest to see if they had good vibes. Otherwise, they weren't going to let me continue. <laughs> Thank God they got good vibes and I was continuing. But a few years later, my show Dracula, she became the first girl in the world to play Dracula. So in Japan, she's Dracula. Hmm. So it's 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 cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Plus that's a, it's been a, an amazing part of my life. Now um, let's let's rewind back to your early days when Jekyll and Hyde was just kind of formulating. Mm -hmm. How did that? What's the genesis of that show, and how did that start out? Wow, down down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the moment for that. Um, yeah, so I was a student at USC. That's where it starts, 1979-80. And I was a history student with a philosophy minor. Um, I had nothing much to do with the music department, where they now have a Frank Wilder on scholarship, which I think is kind of neat. And, um, and I had written some stuff in Miami. I was you know, becoming a writer. I was part of many groups. I was, I was already a musician. I was a working musician which is why I didn't go to music school. And at that time at USC, it was only a classical conservatory program. Now it's pop, jazz, everything, but they didn't have that back then. So I was doing my thing and I, I, had, the, I had the guts, I guess, to walk into John Hausman's office. John Hausman is a legendary theater and movie guy. He was the voice of America in World War II. Let's put it that way, because he, he, he spoke six or seven languages. He discovered a young guy named Orson Welles He's amazing. He won the Academy Award as the professor in the Paper Chase, the movie. He was the artistic director of, of USC's theater department. And I had the gall to walk in there and show him a show I had written in Miami called Christopher. And it was funny because he, he didn't really like any music that was written before like 1920, you know. But he saw something in me and he gave me a chance. And the next thing you know is he, he gave me the USC Theater Music Dance Department. And I did my first show called Christopher at USC. That was 1978-79. So I guess I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. I don't remember the year Phantom originally happened. Do you remember the year Phantom originally happened? I think it opened in London in maybe 86, right. 87. Yeah. But, but, uh, but, but there was something, I'm trying to remember what it was. There was the play, oh, I know what it was. Hausman took me to the theater to see the play Dracula that was on Broadway and touring. It was a play. And that's, that's what it was. And I saw the play and I thought, this is so cool that they took this kind of Victorian horror book and made it into this sexy, relevant show, you know, and for a young audience. And it was cool. And I thought, well, let me see if I can find something from that catalog, that Victorian catalog, to make it to a musical. I read Jekyll and Hyde, which is a very tiny book, uh, Jekyll and Hyde. But Robert Louis Stevenson, who, of course, also wrote Treasure Island, 
uh, not too bad. He wrote this book that was so ahead of its time in so many ways, even today, you know, and, and dealing with the two sides of us and, the, you know, releasing the genie and all of those kind of things. I fell in love with the book and I fell in love with the idea of, hmm, one character plays two people, Jekyll and Hyde. Wouldn't it be cool for an actor to be able to do that and as a singer to be able to do that in two different attitudes and two different musical vocabularies? You know, one is kind of the romantic lead and heroic and the doctor trying to change the world and to do good. And the other is the other. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Hyde, who, by the way, you know, we, we say with Jekyll and Hyde, good and evil. That's what we always talk about. But Hyde didn't think he was doing anything evil. I just thought he was free of all bounds of anything from society and, and he could just go do what he wants. And Hyde actually celebrated his life in a way more than Jekyll did his because Jekyll had a consciousness mm -hmm. where Hyde really doesn't. I fell in love with all of this and that's where it started at USC in 1980 is where Jekyll and Hyde started. It was, who knew it was gonna be 17 years later when it premiered on Broadway, mm -hmm. but it was worth the wait and worth the journey uh, we, you know, the journey, you know, included Jekyll and Hyde as an American. I was the only one at that time really being a bridge between the theater world and the record business because my life was the record business throughout the eighties and the early nineties. But first BMG RCA with the London symphony and Carl, and Colm Wilkinson and Linda Etter. And then later, uh, in the nineties at Atlantic records, with Anthony Warlow and Linda and Carolee Carmelo and Brenda Russell and, and John Raitt and all these amazing people, we did two concept records. Hmm. So, you know, and, and it was hard to do because I'm not Andrew Lloyd Webber. It wasn't like I had a history of that. You know, Andrew is the one who started all that with Superstar and Evita, et cetera. Uh, uh, Joseph, you know, which were all usually successful, but, but my success was in pop R&B. So to get record companies to even trust me, they didn't know the show was ever gonna to get to Broadway, they just know they love the music. And what happened was, you know, this is the moment, someone like you, a new life, once upon a dream, started becoming, you know, recorded and songs around the world. And uh, whether it was Johnny Mathis, Once Upon a Dream, or Styx, Once Upon a Dream, or the Moody Blues, This is the Moment, and on and on, the songs just kind of found the world and a success for themselves. And then, of course, this is the moment which Jekyll sings before he takes the stuff because it's, the, it's that one moment, you know, am I going to go do this or not? And, of course, that song is in, this is the moment, this is the day when I send all my doubts and demons on their way. Every endeavor I have made is coming into play it's here and now today <laughs> this is the moment this is the moment became the song and you know uh, whether it was the super bowl or the world series or the world cup soccer whether it was clinton's inauguration whether it was miss america or the ice skating world sports events all around the world um nbc picked it up and it became kind of the unofficial olympic theme for like three olympics which is 12 years of olympics <laughs> you know for the song and, you, you know, there's a saying about um, it's great to, to have a show where people leave the theater humming the melody, but I like better when they come into the theater humming the melody. Mm -hmm. So because of the success of the albums and the recordings of the songs, we were able to achieve that. And there you go. That's, mm -hmm. kind of, <laughs> that's, that's this is the moment and, and Jekyll and Hyde and how it all started. What most people don't know and, and that they're always surprised about is Jekyll and Hyde is my first show, you know, that I wrote, but, you know, totally wrote with, of course, the great Leslie Brickus, who, by the way, on Friday is going to be 90 years old. Hmm. Best songwriter that I know. And whether it's Goldfinger or Oompa Loompa, pure <laughs> imagination, talk to the animals, you know, on a wonderful day like today, once in a lifetime, you only hmm. live twice. Um, I mean, I can imagine pure imagination, feeling good. He wrote that in 1963. It's a giant hit today again. Um, hmm. Anyway, it's going to be 90, so a shout out to Leslie. Uh, wow. Leslie. Um, but, um, you know, who knew what was going to happen? But the point is, is that the year before Jekyll and Hyde, 
Victor Victoria came to Broadway with Julie Andrews. Now, Leslie and his partner, the great, great Henry Mancini, won the Academy Awards, both of them, for the score of Victor Victoria. Unfortunately, Henry got ill, and he wasn't going to be able to finish the score for the theater, you know, which was going to be some additional songs and stuff. And Leslie played Julie Andrews and Blake Edwards, the, the director at, at that point, my music from Jekyll and from Linda Etter Record. And Julie and Blake and they said, OK, let's get this kid to work with us a little bit. And, the, and then, of course, thank God, Henry Mancini's widow, Jeannie Mancini, an amazing woman, signed off and, and gave me the shot to do that. Hmm. And so the first song I ever wrote in the theater professionally, I guess, is Living in the Shadows, which is the um, 11 o'clock song for Victor Victoria, for Julie hmm. Andrews. Wow. Most people don't know that, but that actually <laughs> happened a year before Jekyll. Oh, okay. Once Jekyll happened, Jeffrey, uh, then it kind of, you know, it, it, Scarlet Pimpernel and Civil War and Dracula, these things just came and, and you know, I didn't even I didn't know what I was doing. I was going so fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next thing you know, like you said, we had three shows on Broadway and at the same time. And that was that. <laughs> wow. What, what a trajectory. That's, that's pretty exciting. Um, you tend to explore very dynamic themes in your shows, these characters that are larger than life and facing um, real dilemmas, you know, like good, the good versus evil question comes up a lot. Um, is there something that in particular that, that draws you to these, these characters or these stories that are so well known? Well, yeah, uh, yes. And, and you actually just basically stated my own philosophy and my own answer to the question, which is, I seem to be drawn to characters that are bigger than life in situations that are bigger than life mm. and have enormous stakes to them because the stakes being so high, it just heightens everything around them. And that sings to me for, for some reason. That's where the music comes from. So if a guy you know, is going to kiss a girl goodnight, that's one thing. But if he turns around and bites her on the neck and gives her everlasting life, that's <laughs> another thing. And so, you know, that guy deserves a musical, right? You know? yeah. That's you know, guys trying to change the world. He's trying to to, to, to to divide good and evil because he feels if he can do that, man is strong enough and willful enough and his, with his help get rid of the evil. And instead, you know, he plays God and he can't do that. And by doing that, he creates a Mr. Hyde. So that guy deserves a musical. So mm -hmm. I, I ask that question a lot, you, you know, and, and, and the answer, if the answer is yes, then usually that's a subject matter or something or story that I want to tell musically. Hmm. Not always the case, but most of the time. And, you know, I, I, I'm also very much, you know, I have two sons and, um, and what I wanted to do a lot was do stories that I loved that maybe my parents know in one way, but my kids, they, they like a different kind of musical vocabulary. And the best example of that is Excalibur, King Arthur. You know, Lerner and Lowe wrote Camelot, which is one of my favorite scores and gorgeous songs and stuff like that. But when my kids were younger, they could listen to a few minutes of that and then, OK, you know. But if you tell that story and give it a rock score, a symphonic rock score, all of a sudden, you know, that opens the door. And that's 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 uh, that's the reason a lot of these shows existed, too, because of trying to write it for my kids. Hmm. Wow. That's great. I didn't realize that. Um, let's, do you have any, uh, any songs in your book that you'd like to share with us a little bit of a snippet of? We loved hearing, uh, this is the moment. That was fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, um, but I need my glasses. So I have to find my glasses. It, I'll, I'll play you a snippet from the, from the symphony. It'll oh, the I first love that. Time that. That I've done that. So world it, premiere right here. Yeah. You got to give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, and I'll do that. You know, this is a completely different thing for me. Um, but it's been so much fun. And uh, it's like climbing Mount Everest musically. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes over this year that I've been writing it, you know, I'm listening to a lot of Rachmaninoff or Stravinsky or Tchaikovsky or Debussy, you know, some of my favorite people. And I listen and I go, what am I doing? What am I, <laughs> you know? But, you know, you do your best and, and you see what's going to happen. So. Let me uh, find this. I'm not going to play a whole movement, but I'll play just a little bit for you. Sure, yeah. 
how long how long do you anticipate the the whole work will be somewhere between about 50 55 minutes wow you know it'll be you know it'll be a full thing mm -hmm. um in fact we just got it in an invitation from in athens in 2022 you know, you know, I do these Frank and Friends shows. You know them because you've produced them uh, <laughs> and have given me some wonderful memories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what they're going to do in, in, at the Acropolis in, in uh, Athens is that the first act is going to be the symphony. Ooh. And then the second act is going to be Frank and Friends with some big uh, stars over there. Huh. So that should be quite an evening. Wow, yes. I, 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 think, I, I think optimistic, and you know I'm an optimistic guy. I think that uh, if the symphony is received well, that's going to be a, a life-changing kind of thing. Yeah. So, huh. Anyway, here's a little something. <laughs> Beautiful. That's a little <laughs> bit of, of the beginning of a, of a movement. So. Well, we're very honored that we got to hear one of the first. Absolutely. Snippets of that. That's great. Um, one thing we like to do is invite students to ask questions of people that are working in the industry. And we do have a student with us today who would like to ask a question of you. So Hanson Harden is a theater major from Columbus, Georgia. So let's welcome Hanson. What is your question for Frank? Hanson, how you doing, Hanson? Hi, I'm doing great. How about you? Great, great. What's up? Um, so my question is, what advice would you give to someone who's like just starting out creating their own music and lyrics? Well, I think the first thing is to be a student. Uh, my, my number one philosophy in life is to be a student. If you are a student of a thing that you are passionate about, can't be a student about everything in your life. But if you find something you're passionate about, and obviously music, we're talking about music right now, and you're a student of it, you'll never grow old because there's just too much out there. And there's so much to always take in and listen to and be inspired by that you will always be growing. So I think that's the number one thing creatively. There's a thing sometimes in New York, it gets very snarby about what theater music is and what it isn't. If it sounds like Sondheim, it is. If it doesn't, it's not, you know. Now that's changing. And of course, you know, Hamilton has been a giant, giant thing. But even when we were doing Jekyll and Hyde and stuff, a lot of people said, well, that's not theater music. That's too pop, you know what I mean? And I thought, well, that's horrible to even say that. Pop means popular. Why is that a bad word? So don't be afraid of being popular. But I think what you gotta always be is open. Open like a sponge to all kinds of things. You know, Duke Ellington always said there's only two kinds of music, done well and not as well. You know, and you have to find something that you love in every every style. And so always be open and always be a student. And I think creatively, if you can continue that kind of attitude, that would be great for any young artist. The other side, of course, is the business side. It's a tough business. And it's a business of failure. 
what do I mean by that? If you're a baseball player, okay, just follow me for a second. <laughs> and every time you get up, two times you get out and one time you get a hit. That means your average is 333. You could say you failed two out of every three times. You could say that, right? Well, if you're a baseball player and you batted 333, you will end up in the Hall of Fame as one of the greatest players that have ever lived, okay? Cole Porter has like 4,000 songs in his catalog. If you are the biggest Cole Porter fan, you know 50 of them. Does that mean he failed all those other times? No, it doesn't. It's all part of the process and the journey and things like that. So you have to really kind of not take no for an answer and be thick skinned because there's going to be a lot more no than there's going to be yes. Trust me. When I was coming out of USC and I was being a, trying to be a pop writer, I had two, three hundred songs turned down before I got the first one. That was a yes. But that one yes changes your life. And all it needs is one yes. And you have to remember that. And that should keep you going. So creatively, be a student and never stop being a student. And business-wise, understand the reality of what it is. And you have to be persistent, passionate, and you have to be in love with it. You know, it has to be that, that important to you. Mm. That's my advice. Thank you so much. Wow. You know, very very nice. Thanks, Hanson. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that is that that is great advice. I think one thing I have noticed as I've interacted with creative people such as yourself over the years is that they are very curious about not only their own craft but about what's going on in the world and about history and all sorts of things and and I think that really informs the creative process continually. You know, sometimes as a writer you know, you want to move a person and make them happy or make them sad and do all of these things. I also think as a writer, it's important sometimes to observe the world that we live in and report back about it. And I, I think, you know, when you look at the, the 60s and 70s, for instance, all the great songs that are social changing songs like Bob Dylan songs and stuff like that. It was like, you know, he was watching and, and observing and then telling us about it. And I think uh, that's important. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not surprised that you say that because I think writers need to be in touch with what's going on, especially we're writing for today. You know, we're not writing for another time. This is what mm -hmm. we're writing for. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever think of giving up <laughs> in the early days? Maybe you probably did when it was hard and you're pounding the pavement. You know, it would be easy to say to you, I did, but that's not me, Jeff. Mm -hmm. It's just not me. You know, um, my teachers early on were older African-American black jazz musicians in Florida that I got a chance to play with. And the ones who saw something in me would always say, because I would always say, you know, I need to do this. And my dad, you know, he wants me to do business and all this kind of stuff. And he says, OK, but you need a net to, to, you know, to catch you. And they would always say, no, you don't need a net, because if you have a net, you might actually use it. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's not who you are. So mm -hmm. I kind of flew without a net and it worked for me. Now, don't do it. That's not a philosophy for everyone. You know, that was specific to me and my ridiculous cockeyed optimism even back then that this is going to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was 15, I made my first eight track recording that I raised money for. And it was called Looks Like We're Going to Make It. <laughs> that's what it was called. <laughs> you know, but you know me, Jeff. So that's, you know, that really hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, and I still feel that way. And I still feel like looks like we're going to make it because no matter what I've accomplished, I, it's always about next. It's mm -hmm. always about the next mountain to climb and stuff, mm -hmm. which keeps you hungry, I think. Uh, it yeah. keeps you young as well. But it is a tough business. It really is, you know. And, you know, even if, when I give advice and stuff, you know, you almost have to know the person because everybody needs a different mm -hmm. kind of path. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So. Yeah, that's true. Not everybody gets there the same way. They all, they all go through the doors that open to them and follow the path that is probably the path that maybe is the one they should take, I imagine. So. Yeah, you, you know, and then again, listen, there's a guy in a bear suit holding a sign, an out-of-work actor trying to make it, right? And he's wearing a bear suit 
and I guess he's advertising for some company or restaurant. And two weeks later, he gets the audition that someone actually says yes, and he becomes Brad Pitt. <laughs> and that's the magic of this crazy business. Yeah, you know, you know, wow. the, the the guy, um, what's the guy was living in his car in L.A. He was literally living in his car, and then he got uh, Avalon, huh. and then Terminator Two, Sam Worthington, I think his name is something okay. like that. I mean, you know, you know, you hear these stories all the time. You know, yeah. the musician who lives with her mother in her VW van going up and down trying to get gigs becomes signed by Atlantic Records and becomes Jewel. You know, you, you, you know, this is the craziness of this business, because unlike other businesses, there's no, you know, there's no scientific formula. There's no you go to school, you get good grades, you pass the bar and you become a lawyer there. That there doesn't exist in the creative world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just kind of never know. But which is why you got to be thick skinned and you got to persevere and you got to have a lot of belief and hopefully you surround yourself with people who will not just believe in you, but be honest with you, mm -hmm. you know, which is not your parents and your grandparents. You <laughs> yeah. know? And I always say to young writers, you know, as soon as they can, they got to get feedback from people who do it for a living and publishers and things like that and get a realistic assessment of what, where they could go and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's good advice. That's important advice. Yeah. Well, you're in a college, you know, uh, environment there, and I'm sure you have plenty of young, talented people there. Um, but each one has a different story, and each one is going to have a different story. Ninety-eight percent of them are not going to make a living doing music, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and the difference sometimes between that two percent is not just talent; it's a lot of other things, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I always talk about that, the social aspect about this business, you know, where it's such a social business. Hmm. You got to make people root for you and like you. My hmm. dad used to always say to me, it's not ever what they say to you. It's what they say about you when you turn your back, hmm. you know, and that's something, you know, that, that, that still rings true to me. You know what I mean? How do you get people to believe in what you believe in and hmm. then actually want to go to bat for you? Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's tough. That's not easy. But yeah. these are all things that are kind of my master class and all mm -hmm. that, which I, one day I'll probably do one for you down there. Yes. Well, before we wrap it up, I just want to ask one, maybe one last question. And sure. what, what do you, as you look to the future, um, not necessarily specifically to Broadway and musical theater, but maybe, what, what would you like to see happen in the future, given where we've been as a country and a world over the last year? Do you have any specific hopes for tomorrow? I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, creatively especially, because there was a time where Broadway was on an island unto itself. It really was. You know, the rest of the world, creatively, the pop music world, the movies, the television, was embracing pop music and all kinds of music. Broadway seemed to kind of circle the wagons and stay in their own world. I, I had to fight that, you know, I, I, I know I was one of those people who were fighting that, you know, with, with Jekyll and Hyde, um, especially with Jekyll and Hyde, you know, uh, the fact that I had not come up from the ranks of theater and I came from pop music and black pop music. I, I took a lot of shots for being the pop guy and they were not saying that in a nice way and stuff, but we persevered and, and the rest the history speaks for itself. Now, we live in a world that and Broadway is much more open. Theater is much more open. Hmm. And, and, and you have pop writers writing for theater, some of which, you know, grew up on my stuff and, and say, you know, thank God you did what you did because that opened my ears for that. Hmm. Um, and then the enormous success of Hamilton and the multiracial aspect of what that is, both creatively, business-wise, and just what, what it is out there in the world. And I just think, you, you know, the big hit last year, what was it? Off, um, it was the one... Hades Town. Hades Town. You know, another great example, multiracial, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I just think it's more open. People are more open. I, I do think it's more homogenized. I think because there's so much music on TV now, you know, you know, Glee and all the Disney stuff and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's good. So you have younger generations now growing up. The theater music is something that's not just their folks music. It's their music, too. Hmm. So that's that bodes very, very well for the future. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just the international thing. 
you know, I mean, I, I feel like I, I told you I'm on the forefront of all of that. And what I'm seeing is wonderful. You know, you go to a show in Seoul and it's the audience, they're couples, so like going to the movies. You know what I mean? The people in their 20s and 30s and the tickets are expensive, you know, but they're somehow they're paying for them. Hmm. But they're bringing their energy, their youthful energy and where they are in the world. So you see younger audiences coming and hearing younger music, and that bodes well because now they're going to grow up and theater is part of their life. So because of my own observations, especially internationally, I'm optimistic about it all. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be scary first, what's going to happen, especially here in America, mm -hmm. because there's so many factors and politics seems to get into everything, even the culture and stuff like that. But maybe, thank God, that's passed a little bit and things will get better there as well. But overall, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic about where it's going. And, and, and that means creatively. And therefore, that rest will take care of itself because if it's good, people will come. Hmm. Well, I love your optimism. I always love your optimism. It's very hopeful. So thank you. <laughs> so that's the only way I know how to be. Yep. Well, it's been a great treat to talk with you today, and uh, we appreciate learning about your your past and your hopes for the future, and really thank you for taking some time to be with us today. Absolutely, Jeffrey. You know, you, you, you've meant a lot to me, you know. <laughs> you did present Monte Cristo for the first time in America, and the relationship that we've had over the years has led to some great adventures and great memories, and I, I thank you for that, and I, I just hope that they will continue. Me too. I really do too. <laughs> All right. Aloha and lots of love. All right. Goodbye. Wow. I always love talking to Frank and I hope all of you had a, had a great uh, experience listening to his words of wisdom and hopefulness. Thank you so much for joining us for our arts chats today. We have a lot of great events and performances still to come in the weeks and months ahead. Please visit us online at pac.uga.edu to learn more about it.